Welcome to the Cherry Picker, the horror movie podcast where we like to kill people, but not really. I'm your host, Zach Cherry, and with me, as always, is... For God's sake, what happened to her eyes? Eddie of Edward is True. (laughs) And uh, today, uh, if you couldn't already tell, we are going over (laughs) The Evil Dead, the original, released October 15th. 1981, directed by Sam Raimi, starring Bruce Campbell, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna try a new thing because actually I, I had a comment on YouTube and I I I'm so sorry I didn't uh, keep track of of the person who said this but I totally agree with them and uh, mm. they, they said that we should be. I guess like like doing a summary of whatever the movie is or just like a quick like what it's about because it is very presumptuous of us to just go (laughs) off of of thinking that everyone listening or watching has already seen the movies that we're talking about uh because for us like these are these are movies that we grew up with so we know them like the back of our hand but there are a lot of people who are new to the genre and are discovering these movies for the first time and i know that there's certainly a lot of titles that I want to get to uh, coming up in the future here that I know even like a lot of mainstream audiences haven't seen. So I think now is a as good a time as ever to kind of implement this thing. So f- from now on, the, the, the new segment, I don't even know what we're going to call this, but Eddie is going to do a reading of the... Uh, yeah, dramatic reading. <laughs> is it going to be dramatic? We'll see how that goes, but... I mean, it's me, so probably. But but but, uh, uh, but having said that, here's Eddie with a dramatic retelling of the story of the Evil Dead. Five Michigan State University students, namely Ashley Williams, his girlfriend Linda, his sister Cheryl, their friend Scott, and Scott's girlfriend, Shelley, all vacation at an isolated cabin in rural Tennessee, their first night in, the cabin's cellar trap door flies open. Ashley and Scott find the Naturam de Monto, a Sumerian version of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, along with archaeologist Raymond Nobe's pre-recorded tape of incantations that resurrect a demonic entity when Scott plays them. After Cheryl goes into the woods to investigate strange noises, she is attacked and raped by demonically possessed trees. Ashley agrees to take his now panicked sister back into town only to find the bridge they took to the cabin has been destroyed, stranding them. Back at the cabin, one by one, each member of the group succumbs to the entity by becoming a deadite, gleefully attacking whomever remains unturned. In the end, only one will survive. The Evil Dead. Good, no? <laughs> Single clap, thank you. <laughs> you you guys let us know how, how you feel about it. <laughs> Uh, and, and and you know maybe we'll we'll keep doing them or not and maybe maybe more dramatic maybe less dramatic but uh, let us but know. But that, yeah, that's the that's the Evil Dead uh, for you in a nutshell. Now we're gonna mm-hmm. crack that shit open and uh, and go through it all. So um, normally we start this way. Like I ask you, what what's your experience with this movie? What was you know your your first time, as it were? This is- Yeah, this is one of those movies I don't remember my first time. I know it was not the first Evil Dead picture I saw, um, but I did, and I was told actually to avoid it by uh, who encouraged me to see the sequel, uh, Mm -hmm. Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. And um, I avoided it for a few years until I was in my 20s. And then I think I just saw it because after hearing... Uh, enough about what makes it different from the second movie I was you know my interest was peaked and so I watched it 
I don't remember it having a tremendous effect on me, but I was glad to have crossed that hurdle to familiarize myself with it. In recent years, I mean, I own it. But, <laughs> <laughs> that that but... should be enough sad. It's just like if you own it. <laughs> I mean, for, for someone like you, you because you're more uh, like discriminating when it comes to the movies you purchase. For me, yes. I've got a parent, I forget the count. It was like in the 600s at this mm-hmm. point behind me. So, I mean, like, obviously, Evil Dead is going to be one that's in my collection. But sure. uh, I I, th- I think I know where you're going with this, but, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this is the, the thing, and we'll talk more about this as we as, as we progress. But mm-hmm. um, in recent years, I've I, I felt kind of like more and more detached from it. And then finally, I was screening it last night, and something kind of magical started to happen because I think I've made the mistake of watching this one with the intention of watching the second one after whether it's right after or the next night or something like that Mm -hmm. i don't think that's the way to watch this movie i think watching it on its own kind of the way it was released and taking it as itself and not like the first chapter in like you know the ash williams (laughs) kind of you know uh uh, well the thing uh, with saga yeah the thing with these movies so there's at this point there's four there's a new one coming out called Evil Dead Rise or Evil Dead right, Rise. something like that. Um, which I know nothing about. Um, no. But apparently it has Sam Raimi's uh, stamp of approval. Nice. Uh, but uh, yeah, so there is the, the, the four movies. I don't know if the 2013 one is considered canon. I know that Bruce Campbell does appear in it at the end like they dur- during the end credits uh he's i mean and he has his, a cameo. the car yeah. the car is in the movie um yes. the, the wrecked car but it's it's kind of it's a, a standalone thing but i do like the like thinking that it's you know it's part of all the same timeline but the thing the thing with these movies uh is that like with two and three especially is the it basically starts off like the the uh, the prologue is a remake of the first movie, which is just mm-hmm. becomes more abridged with every new entry that they <laughs> they tell the story. So I'm sure there is like a super cut that someone could do of just like have the Evil Dead and then ha- then move on to the Evil Dead Two, but cut out the beginning portion, like maybe the first five minutes of the Evil Dead Two, and then the same. With once you get to Army of Darkness and just have like a full stretch of, of this storyline, mm. which then goes into the the show, the television series, which I haven't seen, so I you know we're we're not going to be talking about about that. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, my, I mean, the first time I saw it, I I I didn't really know anything about it. I I think uh, it was a friend of mine, because um, I would you know normally go over to his house uh you know every weekend and he had all the vhs movies um like i think he would just pick them up at the the video store you know like you could get the previously viewed vhs's or whatever Mm -hmm. i don't know where he had gotten evil dead but i remember he was just like really talking it up like i think maybe it was like his dad or someone had had recommended it and we watched it and i don't think like I was never connected to it in a way that, uh, you know, I might have been for Friday the 13th, which which we did last week. Right. But there's definitely, there's something um, about it that, that certainly stands out for me. Uh, mm-hmm. And it is its own, I mean, it, it pretty much is like the original Cabin in the Woods concept. Yeah. And... Uh, I didn't when when we watched it, and I, again, this would have been like the same time that you know I saw a lot of these movies, which were late '90s, early 2000s. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't realize that there was a sequel. I didn't even realize that there was like Army of Darkness. Like the, the finding out that there was like an, a third movie, and it wasn't. It was called Army of Darkness. Like that was a surprise to me as well. That you know this was a continuing series. So I I had only viewed it through the lens of like, oh, it's a it's a standalone movie. Um, so I didn't have that mindset of like, oh, I have to watch the second one right after this. Um, having said that, I do much prefer the second one. Actually, I, Evil Dead 2 is one of my favorite horror movies. Yeah. Uh, and this one is not. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, and I don't, mean, I don't mean that in a way of just like 
being like it's a bad movie. I think this is a great movie. I think yeah. that you know, especially because I, I just watched it, for, like screened it f- to, to do this podcast, uh, and in 4K, and I was actually very impressed with how the movie like was shot, how it looked, like yeah. even like the the yeah. makeup effects. Considering that this was this is like basically like guerrilla filmmaking totally. at its at its finest. Uh, and everything that they were able to do with it, I think the the problem with the movie for me hinges mostly on the fact that the story just isn't there. Like, there's not really, there's not really anything to take out of it. It's almost like, it, 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 it's funny because like, and I, I think I've like talked about superhero movies on this before, but like, go between like Evil Dead and Evil Dead Two, it's almost like X Men to X Two, where it's just mm. like the first. X Men movie is sort of just like the palate cleanser, or just like the, the thing to kind of get you worked up for the, for the for the main feast, uh, which in this case would be <laughs> Evil Dead Two. Um, mm. And it, it's funny because like the, Evil Dead was not created with the intent of there being a sequel. They right. or like Sam Raimi, Bruce Campbell, and was it, who was the other Raimi involved? Ted. Ted. Is it yeah. Ted Raimi? Okay. Is he yeah. the one that was? Is he the one that was in uh, Candyman? Candyman, and the, the Grudge. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah I know Ted. Um, but like that was that was kind of like they're they're just like we just wanted to make a movie. Like they wanted an in into filmmaking, and yes. this was like this was how they did it. And it was it didn't happen right away for them. I think that it. Uh, no. It's like because the the movie wasn't successful right off the bat. Well, it was, was... yeah. I I mean, uh, I know home video helped it a lot, but even like while they were making it, uh, I heard Sam Raimi say. I listened to a little bit of the commentary with he and uh, Bruce Campbell on um, my uh, Blue, and I got to hear. (laughs) uh, There's a lot of talk. It's funny because you. I never would have thought that Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi have similar sounding voices until I hear that commentary. And they're, they both kind of talk in the same place here. And mm-hmm. Sam Raimi's a little higher, <laughs> but Bruce Campbell's up here too. And they're both just talking like, and, and after a while I lose track. It's actually kind of like what I, what, what will turn me off to like a podcast. If two people have too many similar uh, sounding voices, it's, yeah. it, it doesn't in, it doesn't invalidate what they're saying, but it makes it hard for me to follow the string. Like, wait, which one are you? <laughs> and uh, so it's a hard commentary mm-hmm. for me to follow for that reason. But I did at one point know that Sam Raimi was talking, and he said the way to break into movies then, because there was no like you know film festivals, uh, particularly for horror films, you know then at that time, uh, the way was to get into the drive-in. Uh, market so because uh, that's where horror films played and that's where yeah. you attracted audiences and basically just kind of in a very kind of um like uh that that print of halloween that john carpenter and uh, uh the akads were just like you know shipping around you know the country <laughs> <laughs> so it could become the sleeper hit that it was i think yeah. that's way the way a lot of people were still doing business just trying to pick up word of mouth and get to pick up you know demand for this movie and yeah. um so i mean yeah it was always just get get the thing made uh, hearing him discuss uh the casting with bruce campbell they knew bruce was going to be in it and um I think they knew one other person well, and then the rest of them, they were like, how do you, at the time we were like, how do you find actors? Like, yeah. how do you find people? Well, Bruce who are Campbell, be cause I mean, like, they were all in film school together as far as I know. Right? right. 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 And I think it was sort of like, they just decided like, well, you're going to be the actor because yeah. he was like the handsome. more handsome out of them. And <laughs> yeah, he was the one that like totally. attracted the ladies. So they're yeah. just like, Hey, we're going to make like, you're the star and right. we'll be like, we'll cover all like the, the actual technical stuff. And it's it's funny because like I think the first time we really see the character, it's like he's looking right at the camera. Yes. <laughs> he has this thing, he's just like he just like like turns his head, looking right into the lens and smiles. He's just like, hmm, this like goofy grin. Right. <laughs> and I'm just like, what are we watching? It's almost like it's the Bruce Campbell show. And here he is. Like we're Whoa. it's like he's already like larger than life and I don't even know anything about this character or who he is. And I feel like not, even like throughout the rest of the movie, maybe not until like closer to the end, he does feel like a very peripheral 
presence as most of the characters do in this but it's like that we were talking about that last week when uh we're just like how do we know that alice is the yes the star exactly. of the sh- of, of friday the 13th or like the the surviving final girl because you said that there's a shot of her where it's just a like close a close-up on her on her face and just like this is them telling us that it's like it's all about ashley williams and- yes <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i completely yeah. agree and that, that's what i get from that shot it's just like keep your eye on this guy yeah, um, but he's watching you too. That way. Yeah, yeah, but nobody else gets introduced that way, so it's just kind of like, oh, okay, you're yeah. the one that I should. <laughs> you're staring down the barrel of the camera. I should. And I should regard all, you. Yeah, they're all like in the car and they're singing. What are they singing? <laughs> I don't even remember. I don't remember the words. I just remember the melody. But no, the thing that struck me the most this time from the get go. That actually really got me on board for a long, uh, for a lot of the runtime uh, of the movie. That should give you a slight clue as to what happened later. But um, but no, for a lot of the runtime of the movie, I really kind of got charmed by the nature of the acting also. Like, I mean, it was so earnest in the way that I am a huge John Waters fan. And yeah. I particularly, I love all of his films in his catalog, but I... What I turned to his older films for, you know, like that were made in the in the 70s and some even earlier in the 60s is that kind of homemade quality and that almost like watching children do make believe and you just put a camera on them. Only they're not children. They're adults and they're not just kind of like riffing make believe. They're studying lines and develop developing a character. But the character is really make believe. There's like like watching a a kid. Yeah, there's a moment of that. I think it's when they first uh, discover the cellar door and they're standing Mm. over it. And it's the shot of of looking up at them. And it's almost like... (laughs) that 70s show where they're going around in like the weed circle (laughs) but we're just like but it's like everyone's taking their turn to say their line and it's just like nothing about this feels natural in terms of just like how people would be talking in in like you'd have everyone would be talking over each other and being like what is going on it's just like everyone shut up i gotta get my thought in but it's just like they're like well now the camera's on me so i'm gonna say my bit exactly (laughs) and now we're gonna shift over to cheryl yeah. <laughs> see what she has just check in on her yeah um, which i really appreciate i think it's yeah it's, it's fun it's like and, and that's the thing because i feel like the movie definitely starts off very comedic in that sense and that's what i was because mm. because i remember this movie being darker in tone uh mm. compared to the sequel and that when at the beginning because there's a lot of that like vaudevillian humor that we get like the, uh, even like in the car ride over um, when they're driving over the bridge and then uh, Ash, like, I don't really remember if he looks out the window or he opens the door and he's just like, oh, no, and, like, uh, has to <laughs> retreat back into the car. Um, right. And I'm just like, this is a lot funnier. And not funny, but just, like, more, like, sillier than than I remember. Right. But then, like, once we get to the cabin, it seems like it, it does start to get more grounded in, in, in the horror. But it's still, like you said, it, it still, like, retains that that level of uh, of make-believe or... You know, yeah, like a, ho- a homespun, childlike, childlike quality. Not childish. Yeah. It's not... I don't feel that it's amateurish. That's one thing I want to, like, kind of, like, put out there because even though this is not my favorite, um, you know, Evil Dead film and, uh, and whatnot, it doesn't mean I dislike it. It's just there are reasons why it's not my favorite. Yeah, we, um, we don't... We don't dislike it. I... Well, no. I mean, I... I I've uh, been active on Letterboxd, so I've been, I've been I've been ranking or not ranking, but just like giving movies ratings. I gave this a solid three and a half. I, I think that that's where I would out of five. Out of five, that's that okay. My opinion, because I was just like four out of five. I don't I don't know because there is. I gave right. Thirteen Ghosts three and a half, and I think that I would probably oh. revisit Thirteen Ghosts before I watch this. But I mean, when when it comes to Evil Dead too, I'm just like I'm mm-hmm. all over that. Well, um, before we like dive into more of the movie too, like there was something I was looking for, you know, synopses, uh, kind of resources yeah. over a few <laughs> different kind of websites in preparation for this, and I, you know, for this new feature, and uh, <laughs> one of the places I checked out was Rotten Tomatoes uh, yeah. to see what kind of synopsis they had. And um, I scrolled down a little bit. Or I don't even know if I scrolled down to look, but it just kind of happened. And I saw some reviews 
um, from you know appointed critics and yeah. there and it was interesting because I only read like the top two or three and they all seemed to kind of echo each other in the sense that they were revering Sam Raimi and everybody concerned for what they were attempting mm -hmm. and for what, you know, for, for like what this meant for like what followed, like, you know, like the kind of like the legend of <laughs> Sam Raimi begins with the evil dead and everything like that. And also, and, imp and really genuinely impressed with everyone's investment, which I don't disagree with, but I thought it was interesting to see that in movie reviews. I mean, they were more current. They weren't like movie reviews from the 1980s. They were... Well, the thing with Rotten Tomatoes that I actually years. found out recently, because um, I was I was doing videos of, of just like the the franchise rankings, of, or yeah. just like, it was like during the Scream one, because it was like, why are all of these dated for uh, January 1st, 2000. And someone said just because uh, if it was a review that came out before that or didn't have a time on it or a date, uh -huh. that it would automatically be uh, put in as, as January 1st. So, I mean, like, there could very well be reviews on there from, like, the, the time it came out, but it, it always shows... Right. Uh, a, like a like more of a like a influx of, of just January first two thousand reviews and then like a lot of more current reviews because people are you know more obviously active on the internet in the last twenty sure. years than after yes. the year two thousand than they were before two thousand. Um, so I yeah, think that the, I the top, the top reviewer was a YouTuber. Like I was just kind of like, oh, all right. That's interesting, <laughs> but um, no names. But uh... <laughs> was it Zach Cherry? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but no, I, and, and um, the point I'm making, though, is not that I don't feel like we should completely discount, um, you know, the context within, I guess, the, the, the situation uh, yeah. within the, the, that the film was made or anything like that. I think context is something really, really kind of interesting, something important to remember. Yeah. So you don't just take things at face value. That said, it, it shouldn't define the film for me. And that's why I was so happy that early on in my my most recent screening, which I started yesterday, mm -hmm. um, that I was having such a good time. Even just like seeing, I laughed out loud just at the trepidation of the rest of the group as Scotty is moving up towards the the porch swing, banging mm -hmm. against you know the, uh, uh, the I guess the beam and um, or the wall, and he's. Um, and as he's approaching, it, it just the it, it was good filmmaking, like in almost like a silent movie. And there's all other examples of this in the movie too. But just like yeah. in the sense that like I know exactly like what he who he is and what he's doing. And when he looks back, and the rest of them are all just standing there like watching him with trepidation. I understand exactly why they're yeah. doing that. And I don't know. It was a great moment. Yeah. And and I, I, again, just one more thing to kind of envelop me and enchant me and just yeah. kind of you know beckon me. Come watch more of this. Yeah, it's so. interesting that you say that. Like those reviews are kind of like more like hindsighty of just like you know what. Just being like, oh, it's not, you know, it's not really so much of like what it, the movie is or just but like what it uh, evolved into. Because just going back to what I was saying of, of just like that X-Men, X2 kind of yeah. feel. Because um, at least with this, like it, maybe like a better um, analogy would be sort of like a uh, like a short film, which mm -hmm. then became successful. And then like the, the creator got enough funding that they could then remake it to be more conducive to uh, like big screen cinema needs and like what audiences are, are looking into. Because I, when I watched the movie this, this most recent time, like I was saying, like I didn't really get anything out of the story. There's really not mm -hmm. a lot. It's just kind of, there's the tape that they listen to. And yeah. that's really the only kind of, information or exposition that you get and then the rest of it is just stuff happening and mm -hmm. i feel that like that was so secondary for sam raimi and that's not necessarily a bad thing um because right. i do think that you know if this if none of the sequels or anything ever existed i still think that this movie would be a classic it would be a cult classic that people would would still remember to this day but I think that, you know, at the time, it was all about just, like, 
how from a technical standpoint how we're going to make this a successful film and mm-hmm. i think that you know what one of the like there were a few omissions that i you know watching i'm just like i seem to recall a lot of um uh, of like ash's kind of backstory uh or just like where he came from because there was the, he worked at s mart uh sure. and and things like that and just none of that was mentioned in the the first no. evil dead at all so it's almost like they went back to the drawing boards when, when it came time to do the sequel and sorry i'll try not to talk too much about evil dead too but it was like <laughs> it that was the point where they're like okay now now that we we've shown people that we can do what we can do let's put the story in there and that's why i i feel that evil dead 2 does exceed the original like by a by a huge margin for me but it also balanced that tone of, of horror and comedy or i feel like it's almost like you can you can draw a roadmap from evil dead to evil dead 2 and then evil dead 3 where I feel like it's almost like Scream 3 in a way, <laughs> or just by Scream 3, they, they went overboard oh, with yeah. the comedy. Sure. Um, and that's kind of Army of Darkness. It was like, it was almost too silly that they should have just kind of like, they they struck such a good balance in Evil Dead 2. So okay. I don't think that, like, there's not, this movie is not bad. I, like, it's a, <laughs> it's a fine movie, but it's just like we've seen, it's, it is the thing where it's just like we have 2020 vision where it just like we've seen that it could be done better and that's unfortunately how i'm always going to see the evil dead uh, 1981 just because i know that like you know regardless of of whether i'm watching it with the intent of following it up with with the next chapter or or you know every movie after that i i, I know that it's just like it it will get better and i think there's something i, I don't think i think there's validity to what you're saying even I think Sam Raimi would agree on some level just in the sense that like the second movie isn't so much a sequel as it is a remake of the first movie in and of itself anyway. So the fact that he saw fit to go back and kind of like remake it and enhance it with all of these other things, which we'll talk about on that pod Mm -hmm. when we record it. um, I, I, yeah, I think there, I think there's an absolutely uh, valid argument to, and point of view to everything that you're saying. But um, you also brought up, an interesting word to me that I saw in these reviews that I was describing, and then we'll get off the reviews, but it was the word classic that kept coming up. And I only mm. read like two or three, so but I just saw classic, classic, classic. And I was like, okay, so does that word really belong in a film review also? <laughs> because I, it's one of those words that I don't know what a classic means, yet I do. Like a favorite. Yeah. I know what it means. I know what it's supposed to mean. I think I know when people ask me what's your favorite, what they're yeah. asking me, but when I actually put it under consideration and under a lens and go, okay, what is my favorite? If it doesn't, it's it's one of those truths that if you don't know it, if it doesn't like you know, just yeah. buoy to the top, like right off the way, like oh, I know what my favorite is, then you probably don't have a favorite. I don't think you necessarily have to have a favorite out of a string of you know, a collection of anything. Yeah. Uh, the same way I don't, I don't really understand when somebody says it's classic. I'm like, okay, so that means it's been around a long time. Yeah. Had a lot of influence, but does it hold up? Like the real yeah. questions are, does it hold up? And what, what, what do you get out of viewing it out of the context? All that is important to remember. But when you look at it through a lens of just like, okay, I'm objectively sitting here watching a movie and what is my experience um Mm -hmm. but i mean again i don't think one thing that i love about this movie is the fact that there is such i can feel the effort behind it um you were bringing up like um um uh things like the shots and you know the way the way sam raimi like uses the camera and the way even you brought up the uh the the reverse bird's eye view from (laughs) from the cellar that i really really appreciated because one more it was just one more thing that felt even when it was uh like this kind of master shot where you just see ash and um uh shelly's heads poke in um i started laughing again because there was something so incredibly childlike about, like, I felt like I was in the bottom of a hole <laughs> looking up and kids were just peering down to go like, are you okay? You know, like that kind of thing. And uh, yeah. there was, <laughs> and just seeing even, I lo- I like calling him Ashley and not Ash because I don't feel 
Uh, as much as I love Ash, I don't feel that he's quite arrived in this movie yet. And I also like the fact that Linda, I think, exclusively calls him Ashley, and I trust her. Not oh, not Linda. Um, uh, Cheryl. Cheryl exclusively calls him Ashley. And there, I, okay, and, okay. So yeah. here's the. I don't. Rem, other than the line when she's just like, "It's your sister, Cheryl." Um, <laughs> there, it's just like, where is it established that they're siblings? I don't. I can't I don't, answer that question. I don't think that I because I was looking because I know that like Cheryl is his sister, but even watching it because I remember the first time I watched him like wait that's his sister I just thought she was like the fifth wheel, um, oh uh. or, or something but but it's yeah like it it was like one of those things just like okay like that that's a weird <laughs> <laughs> like addition to just be like oh by the way it's your sister Cheryl. Um, well, I think it's so she's so there's an actual connection. So there's actually somebody who it also makes us more sympathetic to yeah. Ashley because he is sympathetic to his sister. Oh, after seeing her yeah. attacked in the woods, I, and we'll talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I but wonder if it was like more so like her yeah. calling him, uh, him Ashley rather than just Ash was maybe more of like a condescending. It, it was like a like a brother sister like you know, like a antagonistic relationship. <laughs> just like you know when you're when you're parent calls you by your full name to just like right to denote that you're in trouble and she's just gonna be like ashley um <laughs> because i mean like i don't know any um boy with with the name ashley i'm, I'm sure i've met ashes but i don't know anyone mm-hmm. that, that goes by like the the full name of ashley um uh-huh. because i you know like that probably would have been considered more feminine than just ash sure. so i can just so i I when I hear her say Ashley, I, I see it more of just like she's mad. She's she's like Ashley, take me out of here. Like I want to leave now. Or whatever. Like <laughs> that's more so her, and not not necessarily because you said it was like establishing a trust or you know like a, a closeness. <laughs> I just I saw more of just like get me the fuck out of here. I'm I'm done. Well, I, <laughs> of course you would, but yeah. no, I also like I felt would. like I mean. Because everybody else in the cabin calls him Ash, and it seems like you know a much cooler name. Mm-hmm. And it seems like you know, like if you if you you know were a man living in like 1981, 1982, 1983, mm-hmm. um, whenever you're seeing this movie in its you know various states of release, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, it, I think it makes sense that like this this young you know uh, heterosexual cis male would prefer to kind of like you know butch up his name and sound more like an action star like Ash. Yeah. And but um his sister's along and 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 still he'll always be Ashley to her. I just kind of like I don't know, I think it grounds him, it makes him also it pro- provides see this is another thing I like as far as the characters and everything like that. This is actually very very similar to what we were talking about with Friday the 13th, I feel. There were a lot of parallels I drew actually. But um one in particular was just the sense that like I get the context of these these characters and the fact that I love that there seems to be such a hard line drawn, even though they connect and they're obviously friends, such a mm-hmm. hard line drawn between Ashley and Scotty. Because I feel like the, they they seem, they're never more kind of like on the same level than when they're down in that cellar and they find the uh, Kandarian dagger and Scotty just goes, huh, this kind of looks like your old girlfriend. And Ashley is full on going, huh, 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 huh. you know, just like an idiot. Yeah. And just like a couple of morons yeah. who are like, okay, let's grab this shit and take it up and show it to the to the babes. And um, But that's honestly like, I think the last time they're really on the same page. Because then once the shit starts to hit the fan, Scotty... Um, and I, it's it's not even like even a positive negative thing, but I just uh, I, I noticed that Scotty is kind of like equally the upside and the downside of like a headstrong proactivity, um, what some people might call like maybe an alpha male energy or something like that. Mm-hmm. But um, but I see it more just kind of like okay, there's a problem, something's got to be done, I'm just going to, like, act first and, you know, ask questions yeah. later. I'm not even going to take my feelings into account or the context of what our relationship was before this happened. It needs to be stopped. And then Ash on the Ash, Ashley on the other side is, like, the upside and downside of a much less certain <laughs> yeah. and a much more, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, a, a much more, uh, I guess, less pragmatic and more... Uh, 
emotionally attached yeah. uh, morality. You know, it's like very a sense of night obligation. and day with Bruce Campbell from from the first movie to everything that follows after that with his character. Yeah. Because even watching yeah. this, I was just like, I, he's, because he's the one that's like, uh, backed into the the wall and and sure. and he, um, Scotty's just like like hit her with the axe or whatever and he's just like right oh, I don't I don't know what to do like it's it, exactly yeah so I I again I don't know if this were, these were things that uh, consciously they decided like we need to uh, redo or retcon when when we do uh, Evil Dead Two mm-hmm. uh, when when that happens. Um, <laughs> Also, I, I wanted to bring up the like also with this movie when it was released, because it, I guess like when. When you put like release a movie, the MPAA does their review of it and and just decides its rating classification, and at the mm-hmm. time uh, there was no NC seventeen; it was X, and this uh, movie. Yes would have automatically received an X rating. And I remember that. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. And uh, Sam Raimi was just like, okay, well, no, I'm not going to, we're not going to let the MPAA classify this. So what will happen instead is it'll just be released unrated, which means that I guess like anyone can see it, but the, the problem therein lies that it's, it's almost like it's more taboo to have not, have like be rated yeah. in a way so that that's the route that they went um mm. f- from what i understand so it's 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 always been unrated and it was huh. uh it was banned in yeah several countries for the longest yeah. time and i don't think it wasn't until when they did finally do the uh the sequel cuz they they had a lot of trouble um getting anyone to finance the sequel i oh. i think that that that's what the case was like it they because they sold the rights to to the original for really cheap um mm. you know they didn't make a whole lot off of that but it was you know eventually when when the sequel did come out um that that was an uphill battle for them but when it that was i think a lot more successful when it did come out or, or just like had a, uh picked up a lot more traction that once audiences started to see it, uh, the the countries that had banned the original started to kind of like lighten up on it and be like, okay, well, you know, there's there's a demand for this. Maybe we'll start to show it. And then that's where it kind of <laughs> did initially start to get its uh, uh, exposure, I guess. Day in the uh, sun. Other than, yeah. <laughs> other than the, the home video market. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. But I mean, I, it also... I don't know. It's so interesting to imagine like what unrated meant then versus like what unrated meant by the time DVDs were on the market and they were Mm -hmm. releasing the R rated cuts and the unrated cuts and everybody, you know, if you didn't have like, you know, prudish parents, you could get the unrated cut that the the version you haven't seen in theaters, you know, that they dare not release. And then you watch it and, who knows why? You know, like sometimes it's I. It's like tell what was why different. Was there was like you exactly know, there was like a nipple for like two seconds longer. You know, <laughs> right? Yeah. But in in this one, I can definitely feel like I mean, this is the thing. Okay, the rape scene. I didn't like it the first time I saw it. I don't like it now. <laughs> I probably will never like it. And I've mm-hmm. heard even Sam Raimi. Uh, uh, I haven't heard it directly from his mouth, but the legend is that he says if he had it to do over again, he wouldn't have done it. And um, yeah, he's not I think a fan. That's the good call. I don't think there was yeah. ever intended to be a like a tree uh, rape. It just kind of it developed that way. Like it just like it, during right. the process, uh, there was just decisions that were made. And they're like, okay, yeah, let's do this, let's do that. Um, so that's how that came to be. Also, I know that the actress who played Cheryl had so probably almost no idea that it was going to happen. I mean, I can, I can speculate. I don't know for sure, Mm -hmm. but I know because she was um, largely not present. She was there for a few of the close-ups, but most of those shots of bodies are not her. They're other people. (laughs) Is that where the term fake shemp? Yes. All those fake shemps are people standing in for anyone 
who's a member of the principal cast. <laughs> yeah, because it's a long so what list. Is, it's okay, like 13 so, or 14 names. Yeah, so that's like... It's a lot of people. Yeah, I was always confused about like what Shemp meant. Uh-huh. Do you, do you oh. know what... I mean, I can well for just for context, because in the in the credits at the end, there's yeah. there's all these characters who are listed as fake Shemp, right? Yeah, and it's an IMDb also. Um, the thing, the way I just I, I, I just I perceive it to mean Shemp. The only Shemp I've ever known is the Shemp of the Three Stooges, because there was a period when there was you know Larry Moe and Curly, and Curly was not a member of the Stooges for a period of time. I think because he was either sick or passed away, and the Stooges still wanted to work, and they needed three of them, so they hired mm-hmm. uh, this guy, and I guess he was maybe one of their brothers, I know, or related to one of them somehow, and his character's name was Shemp. And Shemp, um, maybe a way to make Buffy fans understand, you know, the Zeppo, <laughs> that the Zeppo episode that Cordelia, Cordelia calls Xander, that he's the Zeppo. Zeppo Marx was the fourth Marx brother that was nobody's favorite. He did, he wasn't even funny. He just sang and he was handsome. And, and even when he wasn't even around all the time, when he couldn't be there, there was another Marx brother named Gummo. So you could call them the Gummo, the Zeppo, the Shemp. Like they're basically like the stand in. You know, for yeah. who should be there, but you can't have them. So, I mean, so it, they could all just be like fake Zeppo, you know, fake. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's that's how I perceive it. And it, okay, see, it yeah. makes sense when I, when, I, when I think of it that way. If there's some other kind of like explanation that somebody has, by all means, share it with us. I just, I had always <laughs> assumed it was like, oh, is it like, were they like deadites or something? And that's what they called the deadites were shemps. Um, well, because I mean, they could yeah, have been the they could have been the deadites, but um... well, because that's why the deadite versions of them, like you know, sometimes there's wigs that don't look anything like the hair right. of the person who just turned, and but it doesn't. It it also doesn't hurt it because yeah. it is kind of like otherworldly and dreamlike. I mean, fever dreamlike. And another thing I really love about the deadites makeup that I noticed this time, particularly in the first movie, because by now, you know, the deadites makeup is kind of like, I've been through like the Ash versus the evil dead maze and I've seen things replicated and gone, that is a deadite, you know, like I can, I can spot one (laughs) on site. But even in the first movie, one thing that I loved about it was the deadites makeup is not at all precise, but it is somehow distinct. Yeah. And it, at the end of the day, it's sloppy, but memorable. It still creates some kind of impact. I know people who still, adults, who saw this movie when they were younger and who still don't like looking even at the makeup of the, of the first movie mm-hmm. as kind of like, you know, rough shot as it is. It's, I think it still has an impact. There's something, yeah. if you're not scared of it, certainly bizarre. Well, even and like Linda, because um, her yes. deadite makeup is very like... Very makeup y. She's got yeah. the eyeshadow, the, the 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 rouge. Um uh-huh. the, but I th- the consistent thing is like the uh the the contact lenses. Uh yeah. they have to wear the white things, which apparently they could not see out of. So when they had them and they were very <sighs> uncomfortable, but they were more or less blind while while filming filming that. And when she had to <sighs> attack him, she couldn't actually see him. Um, so that's frightening. Yes. Um, but there, yeah, there's definitely, there's a distinction between each one of them in their makeup that like they, none of them look at all the same, but they still, it, yeah. it does have a consistency about it that it's just like, it, it, it all feels like the same energy, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I agree entirely. And even Linda, like later after... Um, he's dragging the dead body out there and everything like that. And she just kind of rises up for that last stand and everything. There's very little resemblance between that makeup and like what she has when she's inside the cabin, when it's the actual actress. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know who's playing her outside, but um, I also, I mean, just, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask, can we talk about like the logistics of, (laughs) I guess like, I don't know if it just goes with this movie or just all of them, but like, when are you like, once you're taken over, are you just dead? Yeah. Or yes. Okay, so you're so as soon as everyone's possessed, they're dead. Because there was the scenes mm-hmm. where both Linda and Cheryl are like normal again, and you know Cheryl does the whole thing from the cellar, and she's like, "I'm okay now, Ash." Like or Ashley, like you can you can let me yeah. out. I'll, I'll I'll be good. Whatever. 
Um, so my confusion was like, okay, well, is this an intentional trick or is it just kind of like the, the energy of the demon kind of like it just went away for a second or just like they were fighting back against it? Because I like the, the whole time I'm just thinking, well, like you're basically killing your friends when you could have like, like where was the understanding? Where was like the divide of just like, are they still in there? Or are, are they completely gone now and we have to kill them? Contextually, what I always read as the signal that they are completely gone is the fact that when they seem to come back, mm -hmm. it's always it always works in the demon's favor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it always works as a ruse and very rarely, especially in the case of like Cheryl in the basement talking like that that is the last thing cheryl would say after everything she's been through mm -hmm. it's all right i'm all right just yeah. let me out well, of that, the cellar i'm yeah all no i agree with right. that but like you have you have linda who's now like yeah you know she was being more authentic to to what her character would be doing in that situation in that moment mm -hmm. um but i guess maybe this is more so like the the, the fallback of you know having that that 2020 vision of just having seen every evil dead movie because you do have uh, the 2013 version and without going into details with that how you know clearly a big plot point is that you it doesn't kill you yeah um, so that that was my confusion and even with army of darkness because the uh uh ambeth david's uh, -huh. uh character um you know she's comes back from it so um that's why that's why i was just like i don't i it's really the rules of the evil dead franchise mm -hmm. are confusing to me for sure okay um all i will say is uh, i take the lore of army of darkness about as seriously as the movie does <laughs> so there's that okay. um, but as far as as far as what i perceive happening like in the cabin uh uh, uh episodics you know of yeah. the of, of the franchise um and everything that follows in ash versus evil dead there are more examples that i think can speak to what you're asking okay um i'll eventually what, what, get what to I, the series yeah i promise oh, oh. i promise ever i'm making I, I, this vow to everyone listening right now i'm gonna get to it so so good um my opinion but um, spoiler, my opinion, I, lo I love it. But <laughs> spoiler, uh, your but opinion feel... is not always the best one. But <laughs> <laughs> you certainly don't always share it. So <laughs> we'll see. When you see it, you'll just have to get back to me. Yeah. But um, no. Uh, but yeah, that, my prerogative was always just that. Like, if uh, if they had ever shown someone coming back, you know, uh, uh, as themselves and everything, and the first thing out of their mouth was "kill me." kill me fast before they come back then i'd be like oh that's still some of them in there because they don't want to, to be the the like the the what's the word i'm looking for like the vehicle the, the vessel. you know and the instrument of like the vessel of like yeah. their friend's death like that that would tell me that's really them but if they're immediately going why do you want to kill me don't you you said you weren't gonna let them have me and it's like oh fuck you with your guilt trip and your bullshit i mean i've seen i think i've also seen way too many horror movies where like you know a ruse like that is like created yeah. and i i don't buy it you, you know for a second. that's when i'm just like okay you go die okay well uh, here's a okay here's a <laughs> part two of that uh question yes how are they being possessed like how does the how does the the entity the deadite go into them because we see with with uh linda specifically because she gets stabbed in the yeah. heel with the pencil and then later on when she's resting or i guess at this point dead uh mm -hmm. you know he's looking at the the wound and it starts to grow that sort of weird black yes. veiny thing on it so i don't like did the the energy enter into her through that stab <laughs> wound uh, because we, we can, we can assume that with, um, with Cheryl, it happened with the tree rape and then sure. we don't really see with Shelly cause that's kind of off screen or just like when it comes mm -hmm. crashing in and then with, uh, with Scotty cause he goes off into the woods, but then he comes back and it's almost like this slow death that he's mm -hmm. suffering. Like he's like starting to like bleed out of his orifices um, right, but you don't right, really, right, you right. just assume that like some, some bad shit happened when he went wandering off into the woods, but we yes. definitely see Ash get some like 
mm-hmm. damage inflicted upon him, but yet he never turns, at least right. in this movie. Mm-hmm. So, and that was another thing. Like he's he's been there and back as well. Um, so that like, what is your theory on this? Like, how are they? How 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 does the energy pick and choose? I always saw the 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 deadites and basically just like the evil dead cloud that you know that it is um as a communicable disease and basically anytime like it starts with um in this in this movie in particular i'll only talk about this movie uh you're right i think cheryl um certainly if you're going to be penetrated by bushes and trees tree limbs you're going to get wounds and i feel like uh the wounds were almost kind of like the gateway, you know, and that's how the evil dead, like, you know, passed into her and manifested itself later when with the cards and everything, which I love. And oh, that's she's... my favorite scene. Oh, yeah. One of, one of them, but, it's, but very memorable. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Ghostbusters ripped it off and I, 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 I just I get such a kick out of like watching mm-hmm. Shelley just pull one over on Linda going, oh my gosh, you're psychic, you know, basically. <laughs> um, how are you getting these? You're so good. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, but I always felt like, okay, I feel like the wound creates almost like a portal for the demon to enter. But like with um, kind of like an infection once you get a wound. The infection isn't always necessarily immediate. It can be, but it can also, if it's not treated soon enough, then it can manifest, you know, in some kind of like ugly, hideous, you know, like mm-hmm. like bad kind of way. But it can also, because uh, I, I agree with you, I saw Ash get wounded in this movie and I thought like, oh no, like I'm supposed to. But the fact that he is so successfully fighting against them at that point, yeah. I feel like it's almost like a safeguard. It's almost like, um, and also there's something to the playfulness of the Deadites that I, I sometimes I feel like they have just as much fun kind of playing with their food, as it were, you know, mm-hmm. like... Oh, no, I totally get that. And, I was thinking yeah, yeah, about yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the same thing as, as well. It's just like, it's almost right. like we want to keep... Because that, that's the thing that I was thinking about. It's just like, do they want to inhabit everyone? Because then they're just kind of like, you know, when everyone's like crazy and a monster, then it's just like, well, what do we do now? And they're like, nothing. Because we've already, you know, it's just like exactly. every everything ceases to be. So it's just like that's right. that was my mindset uh, of, of like how I interpreted it. It's just like, well, no, they want to keep him alive because they want to like, they need someone to torture. They need to be evil exactly. onto someone. Otherwise, uh-huh. they're they're basically evil for, for no reason at all. And it's like divide and conquer. Like once you yeah. make your way through kind of the majority of the group, so you're no longer outnumbered, so they can't overpower you, mm-hmm. and you uh, you know have the upper hand, and they can't see which body is going to be coming from where at any yeah. given time. That's when you can really have fun and just yeah. kind of like let the madness run free. And I feel like that carries on into. I'm glad you brought that up because I I forgot about that. Even though it was just a few <laughs> hours ago, <laughs> maybe I should start writing things down. <laughs> maybe <laughs> you're doing great yeah, but yeah. um a- another thing uh about it like you you uh just bringing up like the wounds and stuff like one thing that i really do appreciate in a huge way with this movie it's not that gory but the moments where we get the gore or what i guess you know it still qualifies as gore like why yeah. i still went seeing that pencil go into linda's ankle um and even though it, you know, it's not the most realistic looking thing, it looks, it, it, it's uncanny valley enough <laughs> mm-hmm. that it's upsetting because uh, it looks, because if it looks, at the moments it looks real enough, it's upsetting, but it's also upsetting because then it just kind of looks hyper, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Again, fever dreamish, like, 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 like too, too hyper imaginative for my brain to really compute and I just find myself wincing yeah. and especially um like little details like Shelly's limbs still quivering after that Scotty reminded me her. of uh Halloween <laughs> 3 with uh the the uh Ellie bot at the end with just like the the different parts of the body just kind of like still kind sure. of around <laughs> yeah <laughs> she had the and, same um, hairstyle too 
Right. Yeah. Um, oh, but and even um, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll go into more gore, and then we'll we'll go back to other things too. But um, yeah. like, I love uh, the fact that like, I mean, I, sorry to go into the finale so soon, but um, just like uh, that stop motion animation once the Necronomicon goes onto the fire. Yeah. And the then we cut to like the cream That's of wheat. The kind of stop motion. Yeah, yeah, it, just yeah. like of, of, yeah, of like the faces and the body, like everything moving. I, I absolutely adore that. And then the cream of wheat leaking out of <laughs> yeah. the bodies. I mean, that's, and then, I, like, I do, I adore it too, but that's probably like the the one part of the movie where it does feel it, like it really looks um, homemade. <laughs> I mean, it, all of it looks homemade, but that especially, it just, like, it looks really shoddy. Um, but I think, like, again, I think that's part of its charm. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what the... Apparently, that was the most uh, grueling... It might have been, like, the most expensive effect that right. they did. But it was the, it was the one yeah. that, that took the longest. And, of course. And I feel like that, that for a lot of things, it's just, like, the, the thing that you put the most effort in isn't always the, the thing that it's is the most successful like for you right. so i mean but you know who knows maybe some people do prefer that or they like that effect a lot better <laughs> than than every other bit that we see in the movie well i mean it definitely kind of like wins me back because okay it's okay tough love time um i i have to say i was screening it <sighs> Sorry. Last night in preparation for this, no problem. <laughs> you fall asleep now. <laughs> it's not you. It's not you. I'm just I'm overworked. <laughs> right. And I was screening pain. it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Join Patreon, folks. Uh, but I no. I uh, so I was screening it last night, and it's actually uh, kind of like on topic that you're doing that right now because yeah. uh, the moment Ash takes Linda's body into the shed. Um. You know, and he's he's got the uh, chainsaw revealed and everything, and he's mm. you can't he's got this indecision about like you know her beautiful corpse laying there on the table. I fell asleep, and I woke up, and the menu was on, and I was like, "Oh shit!" And I thought, "It's too. L I have to be up early in the morning. It's too late. You know, I'll finish this tomorrow." So I revisited it from that mm. point on. I fell asleep again this afternoon rewatching that scene and I woke up and the menu was playing and I was like, why is this happening? I'm Around fully like awake. A I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so I rewound it again and I queued yeah. it up again and I sat like on the edge of my seat with my feet planted on the floor. I'm drinking ice water <laughs> and I'm trying to keep myself like involved. I'm trying not to also let my mind wander, which started to happen too. And I realized from the from that moment, basically, that he takes the body into the shed almost till... There's some cool things that happen after that. Like, I do appreciate the blood into the light bulb and coming out of the electrical outlets in the mm -hmm. cellar. And then I appreciate the whole thing with the reflection as he's looking into it. And then he reaches into it and it turns to liquid and everything. Like, that's all very, very cool. But none of it really kind of, like, saves me. And but once the Necronomicon is on the fire, I feel like I'm back in and I'm and I'm yeah. watching, you know, the stop motion animation, the cream of wheat, the bloody demon hands reaching out of the bodies, the roaches scurrying. There's a lot of uh, visual stimuli happening. The little rocks, the bodies, the, 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 the bodies start to look like yeah. they turn into those rocks that you buy for the bottom of an aquarium, you know, mm -hmm. like everything again, very homemade and very like, you know, mom and pop store. Um but all of that, you know, kit, uh, kicked off with the join us as the last little kind of like, you know, kick over the head before they kind of deteriorate until they come back and chase him and the movie's over. Yeah. But all of that won me back and it convinced me, okay, I don't dislike this movie, but there's something about the pacing. And I talked about Friday the 13th. This, the section I just described to you that I fell asleep to twice yeah. is the section of Adrian King making the instant coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill going in to check the emergency generator. Yeah. And I'm just like, there's not enough happening for me to yeah. get my hooks into. It's kind of like, 
it's that which thing is, we've been showing you that's yeah. happening, it's happening still. But which is interesting, and I <laughs> hate to like keep jumping to Evil Dead 2, <laughs> but the juxtaposition of like the first really like third of that movie, I think, is just Bruce Campbell on his own going through very similar things. Because they're they're right. also retelling the whole thing with Linda and him having to uh, behead her and and uh-huh. all of that stuff. So it's almost like it was done more successfully there. It might be like a, a thing of like hindsight where you know mm. that this has we've seen how they can do this successfully, and I think that that's probably where like uh, infusing the humor and infusing like more. Uh, of an identity for Ash as well, because like sure. even like right off the bat with Evil Dead Two, he's so much more realized as a character than he ever is throughout the entire duration of uh, the Evil Dead nineteen eighty one. So I feel that it's it was like just a lot of those things, just like the the scene that you're describing of just going through the motions of having to we're we're just kind of like dragging ourselves to the finale. Because sure. I agree with you. I think there's sure. definitely some pacing issues uh, towards the end uh, where things are happening um, and yes. there's definitely more that's happening here than there was in Friday the 13th in that in that scene. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that like Friday the 13th uh, with, with the Evil Dead is that, you know, it's able to kind of pull out the fireworks for the last, uh, the last yeah. little bit. Uh, obviously, mm-hmm. that was... Betsy Palmer, and then here we have yes. the, uh, just like the the book and and just those those brutal effects. So yes, I I agree. Yeah. I think that the it, it it definitely finishes strong, and that uh, the the moment that you're talking about at the end, uh, which is another like innovative uh, uh, filmmaking technique, is that they mounted the camera onto a tripod, and we're talking about like the 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 spirit like going through the the woods and then through yes. that house and then and then uh attacking ash at the end there that was the camera was mounted on a tripod that which was then mounted on a motorcycle and the camera operator drove the motorcycle through the woods through the cabin and like out the front door to mm-hmm. to get that shot mm-hmm. um i don't know if they did that for like every shot of of the uh the the entity uh, uh, moving yeah, that through I don't know the woods. That was another thing I really appreciated is how you have that kind of back and forth because you're going from the perspective of the Evil Dead, and it's mm. and it's got that like sort of like howling wind uh, sound effect as it's going through sure. the trees. But yeah. then you're cutting back and it's like whatever character if it was Cheryl at the moment, and it's like calm, like everything's like calm and serene. You know that there's like this chaos around her. Mm. But you you can't see it through this perspective. She can't see it. And just, like, mm. cutting back and forth. I thought that was a very effective uh, method, which obviously has been imitated countless yes. times since. But I feel like this was the, this was the movie that really um, originated that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, yeah, it's still... That is something that actually holds up that I think is still effective that I'm so glad... Sam Raimi had kind of like the uh, the foresight and hindsight to realize, oh, that is like one of the tenets of this franchise. We yeah. should hold on to that. That should be something we double down on and then triple down on <laughs> in yeah. future endeavors because it gives it. It's so incredibly specific. Anytime anybody else does anything like that in any other franchise, I think of this franchise. You know, mm-hmm. and um, uh, that that this is definitely something. like a very homaged movie and franchise for sure uh and i just realized how ironic it is that we're doing this uh podcast now since sam raimi is like i mean i guess arguably has directed like the current like biggest blockbuster there is i mean by default since it's uh marvel but uh doctor strange and the multiverse of madness which i still haven't seen um Mm. I, I don't know if I'm going to, but I I, um, I think definitely if, if there is a draw to go see it, it's because it is a Sam Raimi film. So if, mm. if ever there was a, a, a reason that's going to put me in a, in a seat to see that, um, Sam Raimi will right. be that, that person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, there was something that stood out to me because, of course, I saw that porch swing, you know, banging into uh, the wood and everything mm-hmm. and 
the way that was treated. And I, we had just a few weeks ago seen Cabin in the Woods, which echoed that, you know, that moment. And that was another thing that I, that happened to me while I was watching this movie. I just kind of thought like my criti- my chief criticism, I think, for Cabin in the Woods was that it was like kind of like all mind, all logic and not a lot of heart for me. Um it didn't appeal to, you know, my little horror fan heart. Mm-hmm. This one totally does for the most part. Like, I re- I mean, in spite of, like, my criticisms. So it's I've the opposite. Made... It's all heart, no logic. Uh, I wouldn't even say no logic, but I mean, I feel like the logic... I understand the need to kind of throw the logic out because Ashley is trying to piece together what's happening to him in real time as we are seeing through his POV, not understanding... Where is this coming from? And why are you doing this? And what, you know, all that. Um, But it's, uh, uh, but you can only do that for so long before, you know, you kind of become benumbed to it. It needs to, you know, it's like a roller coaster. It has to have like its, you know, its, its arches and its turns. And then it's kind of leveling out to kind of give you a rest. So then it can dip down and then rise back up, you know, and like really, you know, have some kind of like effect on you, um, some kind of centrifugal, you know, cinematic effect. And um, but one of the things that it's one of the chief examples for me of like where the heart is for me. I know I don't think I ever feel it. I feel it on equal on par many times in this movie, but never more so than just the uh, Ashley and Linda sleeping gift fake out mm-hmm. scene yeah. where he's pretending to be asleep with the box on his on his thigh and yeah. she wanders in and there's just that close up on her eyes l- peering at the gift peering at him and then you get him like opening his eyes and shutting them real real quick mm-hmm. just you know so she doesn't catch that he's which really they was... then bring back later on when she's a deadite and right? it's like the reversal now <laughs> And I just, but it's just, that moment in and of itself feels so incredibly, I mean, that's another thing is like, I had I had some time to think about this this week because this wasn't the only horror film uh, I watched this week. Particularly, I watched some horror films from the 80s because I was just, I'm having in a big way that uh, halfway to Halloween thing. I don't know if I necessarily ever articulated it that way to myself. But, you know, and people have been posting about it on social media and stuff like that. And I heard Disney even started mer- its own merch halfway to Halloween, you know. And I was like, oh, great. Anyway, I'm feeling it, though, in my gut, in my in my guts. Mm-hmm. And um, so I wanted to just kind of watch some movies that, you know, bring a little of the autumnal feel uh, mm-hmm. to me. And as I was watching them, I had this epiphany uh, in my gut uh, and in my spirit. And it was just the sense of how grateful I am that quote unquote classic horror movies exist just in the sense that someone cared enough to make a movie without necessarily socially redeeming values. Somebody just wanted to entertain us and just wanted to show people in peril uh, for better or worse, for fun or for, you know, ill (laughs) for like you know for empathetic reasons or whatever but somebody wanted to put an audience on a roller coaster through a fun house and wanted them to experience something just for the sheer purpose of enjoying it of beholding it of uh, of saying this can exist and you can watch it and it's okay it's almost like i reignited we don't, my yeah, love we don't get a lot genre. of movies like that uh, nowadays. Yeah. Like, can you think of maybe something more contemporary that that might fall I mean, under every, that? There's a lot of things made today that I feel kind of answer what was lacking from the movies of yesteryear, and that they feed a different appetite for me. But some yeah. of them still sat. Some some of them I feel like. I mean, I've already brought them up uh, in other podcasts too, and we've talked about uh, one of well, them so far. Th- well, I think that when <laughs> but, we, because yeah. we mentioned the Dark Castle films and how you oh, know, how sure. that was kind of very evocative of like a carnival uh, amusement yeah. ride or something, and I think that those movies are definitely like there's no layers or subtext or anything that you need to like really be prepared for. You're just there to have a sure. good time. Sure. Um, 
but I, but again, with those, like those are big studio films that are, you know, solely being made yeah. for the, for, to, to make money. Whereas I feel like this was, you know, this, this is a passion project for the yeah. Raimi's and, and Bruce Campbell, uh, for sure. Apparently, Bruce Campbell, uh, just because uh, Raimi didn't have enough money, he put uh, his uh, family's house up as collateral or something. So just mm. just to help pay for the, the production of the movie uh, in, in the, the back half. And that's why he's credited as a co-producer on it. Uh-huh. Um, but just, that, you know, that's, that's why they've, they've probably maintained that this... Uh, close working relationship like all these years yeah. later because it's just like they've they basically made each other like they they owe like totally. such a huge huge debt uh to, to the other person yeah and they seem to get along like just you know friends like yeah. but aside from all of that there's just like an actual friendship there's a bond and there's just yeah, yeah and I, I i love all of that and, and in addition to i think i just kind of had a a a, a reawakening of the kind of horror fan I am. I don't like any one type of horror solely. And some people, you know, some people do it. They're like, this is my jam and this is what I like. And then there are other people who, you know, are just kind of like, no, a little variety is a spice of life, but I don't like everything. (laughs) But I feel like for me, uh, ultimately the gift with this movie was just the fact that I was watching one more film where even though there there were likable people, like everything about the exchanges that you described, like even the singing in the car on the way to the cabin, it was like, oh, these are like <laughs> goofy, sweet, you know, yeah. kind of like innocent people that I don't I don't necessarily that... want to be okay. in that car, but I wouldn't hate myself if so I. So was that, in at, that the, at the very early on? Was that the the deadite energy? the evil dead energy going into the car and taking over the steering wheel in that moment, or at least taking over Scotty's hands to, to drive. the well, right. See, this is the thing. Don't they, I don't they have... need them to get to the cabin so they can unleash the. Well, see, this is the thing. I have a theory that it's always there. It hasn't yeah. quite manifested itself in a way where it can kind of have the run of the forest, the way it, it wants to, yeah. but it can do things. It can impact things and kind of curb people in the direction. And if people are, you know, kind of innocent or dumb or unassuming enough, whatever word you want to use. Yeah. Like the five <laughs> to people kind of like, in that car. Like the five people in that yeah. car to kind of like stumble into, you know, uh, uh, the, the thing that will release it into its ultimate power, mm-hmm. um, you know, or at least as close as we get to it with this movie, um, then, you know, then it's it. But I think it can it can it's kind of I mean, and this is I th- this is something that I get from a lot of horror movies. I always go back to like kind of paranormal activity, too. There's something about the way that demon kind of like nudges its way more and more into the lives of that couple in that house um in the second that feels one? very tr- in the first one just the first oh, one they, oh you that, said like, paranormal activity too oh t-o-o yeah you can't yeah, you can't do that with me you gotta say as well <laughs> sorry paranormal activity as well um yeah, I'm just shooting from the hip. I don't know. I, yeah, uh, but uh, no, but I mean, like in that, it, particularly like in in that first movie, just like the way it kind of like gains entry and then yeah. finds ways to gain more and more power, more and more influence, more and totally. more of a way in. It seems to be more of a dominating figure. I feel like that's what's happening. Like this thing yeah. can like you know fuck with your steering wheel. It can bang a porch swing. <laughs> it can mm-hmm. flop. The, cell, the hours later, it'll yeah. you know it'll like recharge its its energy that, and flop the cellar door open. It's always there. It's never gone, but it's not quite. It doesn't have the presence yeah. yet. You know, like it doesn't hold dominion over the land quite yet. Also, by the way, that cabin. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like it just gets bigger and bigger mm-hmm. <laughs> as we like go through the movie. And I don't know if it was just like the lens that that they're using the sort of like fishbowl thing where it's just like uh-huh. it felt like all encompassing but it just felt like there was where did all these rooms come from um because <laughs> we see that when we see the front of the cabin it's like it's like a, a small shoe box and then once we get inside it's just like it goes all the way like deep back um to these different sections and then even the cellar it seems like there's an mm. entirely other 
like <laughs> facility down. It's almost, it is the cabin in the woods. You know, there's there's yeah, right. government agents <laughs> that are under. We're we're just not seeing them. Um, right. Well, but, you get that incredible. 360 shot yeah. when uh, Ashley makes his way down the steps and he's holding the lantern and everything of, of the lay of the land. And you still don't really get to perceive. I feel like there's like some dark crannies and stuff that just kind of like allow for, well, is that where that wall ends or does it just continue yeah. to go on into infinity? I think that's all. Also I think, yeah, that was definitely uh, the the intent with, with what they wanted to do. Yeah. Of just of just making it seem like an impossible space uh, yeah. of just like, you know, th- going inside and just being like it goes on for 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 days um right or that, does it <laughs> yeah that, 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 I, I like that about i also liked uh that uh you have the hills have eyes poster which yes. is torn and i was looking at through imdb so i don't know how accurate this is but apparently that was like sam raimi's dig at west craven to just be like this is what a real horror movie is or, or something like that. I, I don't think Aww. that that's true. I just think I it was think like, so it was like an homage t- type of thing or just being like here. Cause it was like a ripped poster. Um, mm-hmm. But we, Wes Craven did repay the homage yeah. by featuring the evil dead in a nightmare on Elm street. Cause that's the movie that Nancy's yeah. watching while she's, she was also falling asleep. Uh, You're right. <laughs> ironically, <laughs> just something well, else I to mean... connect you to your favorite um, final. Game. <laughs> Both I mean, Chris Stanley during the Evil Dead, <laughs> and I understand because it's coming. Uh, is, hasn't he just come back in from? wrestling around with Linda at that point and that's when the door slams and the windows start like you know opening Probably. and closing and it, yeah. it's got that it's got that shot of his face so maybe that was a dig at Sam Raimi just being like your movie puts people to sleep <laughs> it's not really that scary <laughs> but also I mean it could go either way because like you know there's no such thing as bad press they say so no, you know the fact that there's a poster in his movie feels like an homage and the fact that there's like a clip in his movie feels like an homage but it can also be like I mean if they're digs I feel like they're you know they're they're joking professional they're not, yeah they're, yeah they're, they're I think the bo- shoulder bo- nudges to each other like hey Wes Craven and Sam Raimi <laughs> have established themselves as, as like their own, they like not. Oh, I, yes. I wouldn't say one is better than the other. They have their own unique brand that you know no one's going to yes. be like. I'm like whore, and and they're not assholes, you know. Like no, like, like some, and they both yeah, and they. <laughs> <laughs> But they've also, and they've also, like, you know, like most people who have long careers, they've made uh, enough movies to kind of like establish them as uh, legends and names to regard it within the genre or whatever genre they happen to be working mm-hmm. in. But then they also have some examples of, you know, good try, you know, <laughs> <laughs> close but no cigar, yeah. you know, they, if you're lucky enough to have. That's a very nice you know, way of, of, of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's true, though, and I, I honestly think that's what it is. Sometimes, you you know, all you can feel like all, fi- all cylinders are firing in the right direction and they're completely pointed in the opposite direction from where they should be and you don't realize it until it's on screen and an audience is watching. Oh, because that was another thing they talked about uh, was just Sam on um, the commentary, Sam Raimi talking about how difficult it was to gauge what movie they were making at all just because he wanted to make something that was going to obviously please an audience too. He wanted to have us in on it as much as possible. And the only way you can really gauge that is when you screen something for a test audience, which they didn't have. And you can see what they respond to. Like, what are they vocally, you know, like having fun with and what are the, and then when does the room go quiet? And when does everybody lean back in their chair? And he got to do that with the premiere and I think rework things here and there but i think i think that's ultimately also why he made not a sequel so much as a sequel slash remake yeah because it was just kind of like these are all the things i would have fixed if i had the resources and you know the time and all of that so um but ultimately I, i i can't argue with anybody there's enough here that i'm i'm going to continue to own it i'm really glad that i do are you comfortable ranking the, the, or at least saying, where would this one fall uh, out of the out of the four? I need okay. See, because mm, I have ranked them before. Yeah, but it's been a I while. Thought, I, it's definitely yeah, yeah, been a yeah. while since I've 
seen all of them, but I feel I'm pretty confident in yeah in in what I'd say, uh, which yeah. would be uh, two uh, uh-huh. two thousand and thirteen. Uh-huh. This one, and then Army of Darkness. That was and these are and ranking. keep in mind these are <laughs> there is. That does not mean Army of Darkness is the worst. It just means it's the fourth no. best. Because I like I love all of these movies uh, to varying mm. degrees. But just in terms sure. of, of what I get the most out of uh, when I see them. Because it's been a while since I've seen any of them. The, you know, mm. I, I, I think the last time I saw the, uh, the, the remake was uh, probably uh, like maybe 10 years ago. At this point, not that oh, okay. long ago, but no, obviously, well, it hasn't even been out for 10 years, but um, has it been out for 10 years? No, um, at least seven, seven or eight. So. Okay, okay, no, I have it on blue and I watched it during the uh lockdown yeah. part of the pandemic when I was watching all of my Blu rays, but um, uh, yeah, that was my yeah. exact ranking, what you just described when I did it on another pod before, but now I'd honestly, I like two is definitely in the top uh mm-hmm. tier for me. Unfortunately, Army of Darkness is uh, fourth, um, at least as far as I can tell right now. If I revisit it again and I yeah. have a change of heart, then you know that's always possible. But uh, really, I think I'd have to comfortably revisit the the reboot yeah. uh, again just to kind of like see what I get from it because I think it's a solid, definitely a solid film. I think it's an uh, among the remakes and reboots of its little era. I think it's among the stronger. Um, but, uh, yeah, but comparatively this movie versus that one, I, I don't know right now because I did get well, more joy out of this yeah. screening than I think I ever have. So we'll eventually, we'll eventually figure it out. But, uh, yeah. if, if, is there anything else you wanted to, to add or, um, I, uh, one thing I appreciated that Sam Raimi did was, uh, an, uh, he, established a huge d- defining characteristic between these two men that's different i think i already kind of said it but just the way they react to the women in their lives when they are in peril <laughs> complete <laughs> night and day night and day yeah. so yeah i appreciated that too because <laughs> i was just kind of like what a shit and then oh you know that's how i, I feel like that is that going to lead us into the cherry picker hey in my, okay let, let's let's get to it So last week, for Friday the 13th, 1980, we asked you who deserves to die the most uh, between Ned Rubenstein, which was my pick, and Mm -hmm. Steve Christie, which was yours, and across Uh Patreon, Instagram, and YouTube, we have 165 votes for Nettie and 263 for Stevie. Wow! Which is crazy because okay, so we've this podcast, like as you know it as the cherry picker. We were doing podcasts way before this, which are all available on Patreon, uh, which I'll yeah. get to. But um, we uh, <laughs> when when the actual concept of the cherry picker started, um, mm-hmm. or just like kind of formed into what it is now of just like who deserves to die the most. The first one that we ever yeah. did was Friday the Thirteenth. It's and it, our picks were exactly the same. You picked Steve, <laughs> I picked Ned. And when we yes. did that, Ned won. I forget what the margin was, um, but but people agree that Ned was the worst in that. And actually, if we're looking at these votes, uh, like if we pick them apart, Ned uh. actually had a higher vote on Instagram than Steve did. But the YouTube wow. uh, uh vote was was more in favor of uh of steve being Steve's. the most deserving to die so <laughs> actually let's let's just see what uh what the youtube comments have to say yes. uh space invader says bro steve is responsible for every single death in the series he's committed far worse sins than ned who is just kind of a prick <laughs> but nothing too bad. How is Steve responsible for every single death in the series? Because he opened Camp Blood. That's not on him. <laughs> Who is it on? He's a he's running a business. It's they, oh, he has no idea that Mrs. Voorhees. Business. So because so so literally, Mrs. Voorhees can go around and kill people, but it's Steve's fault because he opened the camp. Okay, 
All right. And Ned. She can't help Ned, being way no, worse she can't than help being Ned crazy. Did. She can't help being crazy. He can help being greedy and a horrible leader. Go on. <laughs> was he being greedy when he left that 75 cent tip for? <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> uh, when... By Sandy. 22.8. Steve over Ned, but only slightly. Steve's a predator and acts like a jerk towards the other counselors, then ups and leaves. Let's thank Mrs. Voorhees for ridding the world of these two awful <laughs> <Yeah>. men. <laughs> Thomas Baker says Steve because he gives off 80s uh, perv vibes. Uh, that and he decided to reopen the camp where two people have died at. Mm-hmm. Mm, thank you. Three, technically. Sorry, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Jason. <laughs> well, Stop. Te- technically in canon. Jason of, of... wasn't killed. He wasn't murdered at the camp. But though, we didn't so say I murdered. Can... It's he said died at. Oh, dear God. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Steve <laughs> says, I'll pick Steve because he was screwing around with Alice, who looked like she was young enough to be his daughter. Mm. Uh, Ned was a bit of a pervert, but at least he looked cuter without a shirt on than Steve. Hey, I agree. He's a um, fuck all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Except oh for God. Bluebox87, who says, Ned, he was an annoying a-hole. Pam should have cooked him and served him for dinner. So <laughs> I got one supporter there. Who's your pick for the Evil Dead, Mr. Adler? All right. Uh, my pick for the Evil Dead, um, obviously I can't pick the Evil Dead in and of itself. Yeah, this is a hard one because um, we really only have five characters unless you want to the, the the truck driver or the 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 fisherman on the side of the road or whoever they No, are. I I know exactly who I'm picking. Who is it gonna be? We're going directly to the source. Uh we're going to Professor Raymond Noby. Wait, this voice. is not a character no. No. This is a character. He is not a character in the movie. Yes, he is. Bob where Dorian did he sh- plays where is him. He? He's a voice on the thing, and he is the reason the whole thing no, goes this is this, into... No, no, this breaks He's a the human ro- being it's, who no, exists it doesn't, no. within the lore of the movie. Why? Why? We have... <laughs> We established some, some There is an actor rules. who plays him. He's not credited in the movie, but he is credited on IMDb. He's played by Bob Dorian, an act a legitimate actor who played roles on television and in film, and he also hosted uh, AMC back in the day in the, nope. in the late eighties and the nineties. No. What what no? Why? Give me a, you can't, give me a reason. Because he's why. not a character. You did, there's nothing to him. If he actually <laughs> was there and if he showed up, but he's not a character in the movie. You can't Pick the a... whole movie happens because of him. <laughs> no. He, if he were not a character, nothing. He wouldn't be in the movie. He wouldn't be the thing that kickstarts the whole thing going into action. I, as You're far as I'm concerned, not... there are five choice. If you know, you can even add the the fucking hitchhikers or the the truck driver. There are but five see, choices. Pulling, no, but. You're pulling this stuff on you don't me. Nec- like, no, right you don't now, necessarily. No, moment. we know. We've established clear rules. It's just like it has to that, be. It's a, a human. A, has to be a human being. A cannot physical be physical presence. A physical. You did presence. never say. When did you ever say has to be a physical pre- presence on I, screen? I don't remember. I don't go over every find the little de- detail of what I say. But this has to be understood. That this has to be a character in the movie. You're picking. He is a, a character. He is a character in the movie. Mm, no. <laughs> oh my gosh. How about if that's the cherry picker this this week? Like, is Professor Raymond Noby a character in The Evil Dead? <laughs> that should be the cherry picker. I'm I are you okay, if you're not gonna budge on this, I'll pick somebody else. But this is this is my choice, and it does not violate any of the rules that you laid out prior to this. You're making up a new rule. I don't think that this should be a, as, a as new long as you rule understand that's made up. That, this, is just, this, this is an absolute new rule. No, this is a this this had to be understood. It, like, come this, on. This person this person has a, a name and is played by an actor, and the character that he plays actually has an impact on the story Are they unfolding. in the movie, though? You're talking about a recording that takes place before the movie even starts. They play the recording during the movie. 
That's not, he's not <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so you're not. If you were okay, so uh, yeah, that's. I I, you know I'm just trying to think of like an example of what what I can compare this to of of you saying this, but it's just like it's of a voice, and I can't even think of one because there is no like you are just trying to bend the rules here of what of what there are no rules to be bent you never established must be a presence on screen that manifests itself visually you only ever said has to be a human being cannot be supernatural and we kind of loosely well i think that he is kind of supernatural if his incantations or or whatever are summoning incantations are supernatural he's not supernatural he is a professor Mm -hmm. an archaeologist who found these incantations and recites them on uh but i you know what i'll 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 retract it but this is going on the pod and i want to know absolutely (laughs) (laughs) i want to know what people think about this little rule thing that you're pulling in the last inning Okay. That you're not um, that you're that you're trying to cop out of picking one of the five characters in this. I movie? am not copping out. I am. I just said, I will back off if you are not going to budge on this, and I will pick somebody else if you're not going to budge on this. Are you going to budge on this? No. Okay. No. Um. Then in that <laughs> case, uh. <laughs> Zach's cheating, so don't vote for him this week. Uh, <laughs> if anything, I'm, I'm just, making. You're just anything, bitter because I'm Ned this, didn't this win. More <laughs> what it should be. You're what, the one wait, that's what? cheating. You're, you're like there you're is no cheating. To look, you're looking for there loopholes. is no cheating. You never. You never. Okay. Did you ever establish this rule that the person must appear on screen in the movie before? Did you Are, ever? Say so that? is the character in the movie? How is that? It's He is a character. He has a name. He was played by an actor. He affects the action of the movie. The movie doesn't happen without him. How is that not a character? Explain that to me. You know what? Do do whatever you want. <laughs> bitter Betty. Okay. I'm not bitter. I'm just like I I'm just I'm <laughs> You can't up. make a case. I am sh- no. I can make a case. It's just that he's not a character in the movie. I'm just make your case, sir. <laughs> I'm listening. Why or who I'm picking? Of who I? Because you've already uh, picked who you're after picking. After the points that I've just hit with you, tell me how he's not a character. How? Because he's not actualized in the movie. He's not physically present. He's not even. He doesn't even appear as a spirit or as a hallucination or anything. He's okay. He's an idea. He's a plot device. He's a man who existed. Who he recorded. does not manifest himself in in the movie. He existed. At you're, but all. you're talking like he never existed. He exists in the lore of this movie. But okay. But okay. he doesn't exist from, in so from now the timeline on. So of okay. It, so. so are we saying from now on a hard fast rule is that the character must appear on screen? In the movie, they are a character just... within the movie who appears. No, yes. but the, he it he okay a character within the movie who manifests visually. That's what you're what you're telling me needs to happen from now on. Yes. Okay. Um. In that case, I'll pick <laughs> Scotty because he's a shit. I pick Scotty. He's a shit. That's all. I'm I'm not even gonna put my heart into it. <laughs> well, you've already put your heart into all of that, so. Yeah, right? That's where all my energy Um, went. So your turn. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say Shelly. Because I, like, because she's there. (laughs) I think that she she had the least, she was probably the least interesting of of any of them. And uh, also, as you pointed out earlier, um, she's a liar. She was doing like, oh, you're doing so well at the, the card thing. Uh-huh. So I'm gonna pick her, and and I also just because I love the novelty of a character saying Shelley's dead, even though it wasn't done as uh, as dramatically <laughs> as Friday the Thirteenth Three. three. <laughs> Shelley's dead. <laughs> so I, for those reasons, great. Uh, I I picked her. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we can resolve this by by the next. <laughs> oh, we've resolved it. You've Episode. established the new rule that they oh, must appear rule. visually. I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> vote your you heart. Don't. Vote your go conscience. Go on. Go on.
<laughs> and if you feel, you know what, weigh in. Let's let us know if if you feel that. Uh, a, a recording of a voice can be... Who, basically, uh, who's cheating? Let us know who you think is cheating. <laughs> I don't think it's cheating, but okay. Uh, please <laughs> let, let us know what your thoughts are on this uh, conundrum. And uh, you can vote on Patreon. You can vote on Instagram. You can vote on YouTube community tab. Uh, speaking of uh, Patreon, we do have two new... Or three, sorry, three new... Uh, supporters. Oh. So let us welcome Zach Howe, Baby Brett, <laughs> and oh. Hey John C. Thanks for all coming of you. Aboard, all, all Yay. Y'all. Sorry if this is your... this is like your first experience. It's Don't just, we had to everybody sully who's your, listening. your your welcome <laughs> to the cherry picker with with all this unpleasantness. Um, <laughs> If anything, this is at least more contentious than our "Who Killed Who" uh, debate. But um, (laughs) oh, totally, we we got over that. But um, (laughs) yeah, if you if you guys also want to support the podcast on Mm -hmm. uh, Patreon, you get to uh, listen to or watch these episodes early. So if that's something you're interested in, go check it out. And uh, if you would like to follow either of us on social media. Eduardo, where can they find you? They can find me on Instagram at Edward is Truth is the handle. All one word. <laughs> I I was like picking up uh, uh, Anna Ferris in uh, 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 what's the what was the one? Yeah, <laughs> the House Bunny. The yeah, House Bunny. I when you that did movie. That. I haven't seen uh, that in a long time. I wonder if it if it holds up. Probably not. <laughs> Oh, I know. Uh, and then you can find me on at Retro Bitch Face, all one word on Instagram, or Zach Cherry Eight on Twitter. And also, if you want to follow the podcast, we are on Instagram at the Cherry Picker Pod. And yeah. if you're listening to the podcast, you can obviously watch it on YouTube uh, by going to the Cherry Picker. And if you are watching us. On YouTube right now, you can also listen to us. Uh, the RSS feed is in the descriptions down below. What do we got going on uh, next week? I don't remember. If, if we're still around. Yeah, I know. No, yeah, right. No, we'll be here, but I don't remember. I got too upset. What's happening? Wes Craven. Cursed? Yeah, that's the one. Okay. The Werewolf. We're doing. Cursed. Wes I'm Craven saying. directed, Kevin Williamson written. Let's... First time viewing. Oh really? Oh wow. Okay, well that'll yeah, be interesting. Anyway, let's uh, let's end this because I feel like we need to have a, a chat, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>